Let us pray. Father, as you spoke to those confused disciples, we ask that you would help us to listen to your son. That we would be changed in the process. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Please be seated. Well, we began with that uh, incredible reading from the gospel. Our service focuses on uh, the transfiguration. And I just want to make one comment about it because that's not going to be my primary text. But somebody once pointed out to me that although Moses did not march into the promised land because of his disobedience in the wilderness, he finally makes it in at the transfiguration. Have you ever thought about that? And what a moment that must have been. Peter refers to it in one of his letters at the very beginning, that he was with Jesus on the mount and saw this shining face. And um, my prayer for us in, the, in everything that we're considering about this morning is that we would see the shining face of Jesus speaking to us. Well, it's a joy to be with you. I was sharing with Matt, uh, COVID has complicated everybody's life, including my schedule. And it's great to be back with you all. I'm glad it worked out. It was a pretty much a last minute request uh, for me to come because it's been hard to plan out a whole schedule. Uh, and I was free this Sunday, and you were free to have me, so I'm, I'm very glad to be back with all of you. It would, be a, it would be an understatement to say that we are in a conflicted world. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. A world full of divisions. And when I say that, what divisions come to mind? I suspect the first is probably Russia and Ukraine, because we're all tracking that story, that tragic situation there. I also think of our political parties, which not only are they in opposition to each other, but there's internal division in them as well, significant internal division. Then I look at the culture wars, and we're in a situation where we've had a if you will, a, an ongoing battle throughout history, it's not new, between the gospel and secularism. Or maybe you would say gospel and paganism. Because really, uh, secularism at the heart of it is, pa is pagan. We can see divisions in our own family. I have a friend who has a sister, and the sister was following one of the conspiracy theories, and she will not speak to anyone in her family, including her grown children, siblings, and parents, unless they agree with her. Heartbreaking situation. We've had the COVID wars. I don't know what else to call them. It seems to me that there's an, there's an old joke about uh, a group of Jewish men who gathered a prayer is called a minion, and you have 10 men at least. You have to have 10 to have a minion. <clears throat> and, the, and the old joke is wherever there's a minion, wherever there's 10, there are 11 opinions. <laughs> and I, I don't know about you, but I, I've had multiple opinions about everything that's going on uh, in our culture, including COVID. There's something inside of each of us that divides the world into us versus them. It's at the heart of the human condition. And if we're all honest, we have prejudices about people who are different than we are. Sometimes those prejudices come out of fear, xenophobia, the fear of the stranger or the fear of the alien. Sometimes we're just uncomfortable with certain people. Sometimes we just can't understand why people think differently or act differently than we do. And I know this is a tricky issue, but I think in each of our hearts, we are all racists. We all have opinions about different groups and different races, if we're really honest. It's just part of our sinful hearts. It doesn't mean we act that way. We lean against it. We should lean against it. 
But to pretend it isn't there doesn't get us very far. Jesus makes it clear that these devices desire, divisive desires are, are at the heart of sin because our hearts are corrupted. That's the bad news. The good news is that the gospel is for everyone. And what I want to focus on as a theme today is Jesus calling us to love people on whatever we consider the other side. Because no one is beyond the reach of his love. So I want to start with this question. Is there anyone in your life or any group that you think God could never reach? Search your hearts. I shared a similar message a few weeks ago in a congregation. A woman came up to me and she said, I can't believe God would ever reach my daughter-in-law. She was weeping because she realized that that was true. Her daughter-in-law was very messed up and had really uh, hurt the family and hurt the grandchildren. And she just thought, I've given up. I've stopped praying for her. She was challenged to rethink that. We're coming to the end of the epiphany season. Uh, and uh, it sounds like Matt has been faithfully trying to explain that to you. Uh, but the word epiphany uh, is basically coming from a Greek word which means manifestation or demonstration. The epiphany means the season where Jesus is manifest or de demonstrated to be the Lord over the whole earth. And he came to save us to be brothers and sisters with anyone who truly believes in him. And what I want this morning to do is to talk about Jesus as a barrier breaker and a bridge builder. A barrier breaker and a bridge builder. And I encourage you to just hold those two phrases in, in your mind. I don't know about you, but I can leave, uh, hear somebody's sermon, and I can't remember it 20 minutes later, or at least the next day. In fact, if I'm honest, there are days when I don't remember what I preached the next day. <laughs> Jesus is barrier breaker and bridge builder. And early in the life of Jesus, we see a barrier broken, or if you will, a bridge built. At the beginning of Epiphany, we study the wise men. The three kings. We don't know if they're actually three, and I'm not sure kings is the best word for them. The Greek word is, we would say, magi, from which we get the word magician. Astrologers, but also probably court advisors, probably emissaries is a better word than kings. But some, somebody from the inner court with real authority. And we talk about them, it says in Luke's Gospel, that they're the wise men from the East. Now, to understand that phrase, and to be honest with you, this is relatively new for me. That phrase tells us more than we usually think. Because I've read all sorts of commentaries. They could have been from this city. They could have been from this city. They could have been from this nation. But we're actually missing the point. I'll put it this way. If you asked a Canadian who someone was talking about, if they said somebody to the country to the south, they would know it was somebody from the United States, right? If you asked a Chinese person back in 1975 about who came to their country from the empire to the north, they would know that it was somebody from the Soviet Union. And when it says that the wise men came from the east at the time of the birth of Jesus, there would be no question in anybody's mind where they came from. It wouldn't be a question of country or city. It would be a question of empire. They would have been from the Parthian Empire, the empire to the east. We think in terms of countries, regions, or cities. They thought in terms of empires. So when it says that people came, these men came from the east, they're coming from the Parthian Empire. Why does that matter? Well, you need to know Herod's background, King Herod's background, when it comes to Parthia. 
You see, the world then was ju as just as divided as the world now. And I'll make a long story short. Herod was governor of Galilee under the Roman rule. It was kind of a client state of Rome in 40 BC. But then there was a civil war within Israel, which led to a clash of the empires, a clash between Rome and Parthia. Herod was on the Roman side, but his side lost. And in his fear of his life, he heads to Masada and then to Rome. The Jewish king, Antigonus, had been supported by the Parthians, and the Parthians pushed out the Romans and those who were working for them. So Herod runs for his life from the Parthians. And finally, he returns after a couple of years with Roman support. He had first to Masada and then to Rome. Returns with Roman support. He defeats Antigonus, who is the last Jewish king who'd been supported by the Parthians. And the Parthians pull out. We've just seen a pull out of Afghanistan. And you know how messy those things can be. And we're watching in Ukraine essentially two empires, the West and Russia, in the midst of wrestling with what to do with this particular territory. So then the Romans make Herod king, even though he's not Jewish, although he did marry into a Jewish family. Okay, now that's the background. So imagine you're Herod. You took over the country with Roman help. You've ruled for now over 30 years. You defeated the man who was born to be king. You were born a non-Jew. And now comes, come people, leaders from your enemies, the Parthians. Wise men, magi, whatever we call them. They show up. They tell him that a supernatural star has guided them. And then they ask a question. And I want you to hear it from Herod's point of view. Where is he? who has been born king of the Jews. It would be the rough equivalent, and we've been through this, of somebody showing up in Washington uh, in the midst of about two years ago now, a year and a half, and saying, where's the real president? We went through that, didn't we? Well, there's no surprise at the reaction. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. The word trouble, that's actually a weak translation. Usually the word is translated terrified. Because they've come to the royal city, assuming that the king would be born there, uh, that the people there don't know what they're talking about, and so Herod has to pull in his, his advisors or spiritual counselors, or whatever you want to call them, and they quote a prophecy from Micah explaining that the Messiah, the king, would be born in Bethlehem. So Herod hatches a plot to use these magi as spies. And you know the plot. It's very simple. Find the baby, and I'll get it killed. That's the plot. Herod had a history, long history, of killing rivals, including within his own family. This is not new territory for him. And it goes on to say, after listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. You know that moment, if you use a GPS and you've done it right, which I don't often do, and, and you get somewhere and it says, you have arrived. That's the moment they had as they landed in Bethlehem. You have arrived. And they find Jesus and they worship him and they give gifts. But here's what I want you to understand. Right at the beginning of the life of Jesus, God brings the enemies of the leaders of Israel to come and worship him. And he was born not to just be king of the Jews, but as the shepherds heard, he was one to be born to be Savior and Lord of the whole earth. The barriers between the Parthians and the Romans are ignored by God when he brings the Magi first to Jerusalem and then to Bethlehem. A barrier is broken even as Jesus is a small child. 
somewhere under the age of two. But there are other barriers that are broken as you walk through the life of Jesus. You see him breaking barriers or building bridges in the most unexpected places. Do you realize that in the group of the apostles, you had Matthew, the tax collector, who was essentially a Roman collaborator, and Simon, the zealot, coming from a terrorist group that had been murdering Romans. It's the rough equivalent of Jesus picking somebody from the Ku Klux Klan and from Black Lives Matter and saying, you're both going to be my disciples. There was a barrier broken down between Jews and non-Jews, or Gentiles. Paul writes, together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross, and our hostility toward each other was put to death. But we often get stuck in us versus them. Now, we learn that the Lord cares for everyone, even our enemies, the them who threaten us. And look into your heart and think of all the people different than you are. Are you asking Jesus to help you love them? Look at the divisions in our own country and be praying for both sides. Or maybe I should say all sides. We manage to have a diversity of opinions. Just before the war in Ukraine began, I heard a radio reporter interview a Ukrainian woman who also has relatives in Russia. And he said to her, which side are you on? You know what she said? I'm on the human one. But we live in a culture where everything around us is calling us to take sides all the time. We live in a culture that sees almost everything as win-lose. Social media is one of the many back, uh, battlegrounds. C cable news channels is another that are in the midst of an information war. But it's important to understand that all of those things are playing to the interior of our hearts where there's an us versus them. We're getting a constant message that we have to decide which side we're on and then dismiss the other side altogether. It's absolutely rampant in the culture. We have what I've, I've named the Goldilocks syndrome of dividing people. I don't know about you, but I look around and I look and say, well, that, some people are overeducated. Sometimes they're called the elite. Then there's another group that I consider undereducated. Groups that are too liberal or too conservative, too far right, too far left, too self-effacing or too self-promoting. And the assumption in the Goldilocks syndrome is that we are just right. We rarely question our own values or the sources of our own values. We are the us. And as a result, we ignore God's point of view of the human race, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Which means that we shouldn't write anyone off when it comes to the gospel. We were all enemies of God, Paul tells us in Romans, and Jesus, through the cross, made us God's friends and children. I'll give you a couple examples of people who are on the outs and came to faith. One is of a university, young university professor who was not a Christian. He'd grown up in a Christian environment. In fact, his, his uh, grandfather had baptized him as an infant. But by the time he was 30, he was a self-proclaimed agnostic heading toward atheism. He had friends around him in the university who were sharing the gospel with him. One is quite famous, 
J.R.R. Tolkien, who wrote The Lord of the Rings, was one of the Christians sharing the gospel with him. You've probably guessed by now that this 30-year-old agnostic was C.S. Lewis. And he talks about how the Lord comes after him. And I want to be clear, he doesn't want to believe. He keeps hearing the gospel, but he's very resistant. And he wrote this about one night as he was coming to faith. He said, you must picture me alone in that room in Maudlin. That's the name of his college uh, at Oxford, or Magdalen. Night after night, feeling whenever my mind lifted, even from a, for a second from my work, that steady, unrelenting approach of him whom I so earnestly desired not to meet. And he goes on to say, that which I greatly feared had at last come upon me. He's actually quoting from Job there. In the Trinity term of 1929, I gave in and admitted that God was God and knelt and prayed, perhaps that night the most dejected and reluctant, reluctant convert in all England. But listen to this last phrase, this last sentence. I did not then see what is now the most shining and obvious thing, the divine humility which would accept a convert even on such terms. It's a miracle that his life was turned around. I suspect if you'd interviewed his friends prior to this night, while they were sharing the gospel with him, they must have been tempted from time to time to give up because he was resistant. It was a miracle. Let me talk about another miraculous case. You. How did you come to faith in Christ? How did God so orchestrate the events and people in your life to bring you the gospel? Because God is at the heart of the process. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I love the shining face in the transfiguration. That's part of what he's undoubtedly referring to. God shone in our hearts. And if God could save you, and if God could save C.S. Lewis... Who can't be saved? The Magi led by a star and the scriptures to find Jesus saw this baby, but undoubtedly for Mary, understood that the shepherds had said, this is the Lord and Savior of all. In Jesus, all our barriers are broken down, whether we can recognize it or not, because the ultimate ultimate division between God and us was bridged by Jesus dying for us on the cross. And he calls us to his side, and beyond that, to be like him. Matthew 5, we know the words, but we, we, I think we're so, in such a divided world, we forget they apply. I tell you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, that, you're, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. What's he saying? He said, loving enemies is a mark of your family resemblance to the Father. Paul is writing to a divided church in Corinth. We just heard from 1 Corinthians. Earlier on in the book, he says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and there be no divisions among you, but that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. That's God's desire for the church, spoken through Paul. And then he gives a word to the divided church, and that word is still to be aimed at us today. We heard the beginning of 1 Corinthians 13. You know this part of it. But please understand that these words were written to a church that was in multiple groups. And it probably wasn't a very big group. I mean, a very big church. 
It's to the divided church that Paul writes, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. I would love to see, and I won't go, in, I'm not naming names here because it's on all sides, but I would love to see some of the news commentators try to live by that. But my point is, we, when we're listening to them, need to understand that they're disobeying God's purpose when they start to buy. Now, I think you can disagree with somebody's position, and you may disagree with somebody's theology. But you can still love them. You can still understand they're God's creature instead of putting them into the them category. So first of all, thinking on these things, look at the divisions in your own heart. Where are you quick to judge and slow to pray? Who are those whom you write off? Who do you consider a fool or worse? We are called like Jesus to be peacemakers and bridge builders. We should be praying for both sides in the Ukrainian war. And please understand, there are lots of Christians involved in this situation. There are Ukrainians praying together, huddled underground. But there are also Christians marching in Russia for peace, along with others. There are soldiers on both sides who are Christians. We need to be praying for all of them. I'm not saying there isn't a right or wrong in this situation. I am saying that the people are loved by God. It's true, as, it's true of various philosophies or moralities. Only scripture is true. So we get to say this part is outside of God's will and this part isn't when it comes to morals or anything else. I am saying we need to treat with respect the people with whom we disagree. And we need to realize that our own opinions should be held a little more loosely. So look at the divisions in your own heart. Remember God's point of view. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Or to use different language, we are all addicts addicted to our own self-centered desires. Jesus set us free from sin and death to help us recover. So there is in us, we are children of God through Christ, and we're in sin and recovery together. And there is them, those who do not know Jesus and are trapped in their sin addiction. But we should long for them to get help and become part of us. Our calling is not to despise people, but to love them for the sake of the gospel. Don't write anyone off when it comes to the gospel. For we are all enemies of God that Jesus has made friends. And don't give yourself permission to treat others as less than the creatures that God has made. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, if we're honest, we all have enemies' lists in our hearts. And we ask you to forgive us. Help us to be praying for those with whom we disagree and the ones we... Uh, praying for those for, with whom we agree. Help us to, that, to pray that the gospel would invade every life and that no one is beyond hope. For you can, you, if you can bring us to Christ, you can bring anybody to Christ. And I pray for this congregation that uh, as the divisions, uh, people divided come in and are looking for some kind of affirmation and some kind of identity apart from Christ, we would point to the fact that in Christ we are one. Help us to celebrate 
your kingdom coming and live it out here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.